information systems and organizations. Here, I wanted to talk to you about information systems, organizations, organization people, which is a reference to the William White book, Organization Man, but I'm referring to organization people, society of large organizations and industrial versus digital economics. So mostly the conversation will be about organizations and society, but I'll introduce a little bit uh, on the notion of information systems. So information systems. Information systems are the combination of components used to collect, store, process, and manage data with purposes to provide information, knowledge, and digital products. Often information systems are identified with the following components. They're about people, they're about processes or behaviors or procedures. They're about policies and regulations. And they're also about hardware and software. So we have both a human component here and there is a technology component and there's also a kind of a behavioral component and there's a legal or policy level component. Often when people talk about hardware and software, often they will break it up as well. So for example, databases are usually an important component of information systems and there are may even be conceived as separate than the other types of software. And there's also a database specific hardware and there's spe specific database hardware. Throughout the course, we'll delve in more detail on the specific hardware and software components. But when we think of information systems is the interaction of these various components together. Another diagram that I like is this one here of the information technology landscape of the world. We have various activities in person, in physical world, um, online as well. They're all being recorded with uh, numeric data, textual data, a video format, audio format, our emails, uh, people protesting in the streets regarding information technologies. Their protests are also being filmed and they're protesting about uh, maybe not being filmed on the streets uh, or keeping the internet free and open. So supporting things like net neutrality. We have office productivity tools in which we create the documents that are necessary to fulfill our professional functions. Our technologies, our hardware have different kinds of operating systems and applications that we need to use, the servers which power the, the applications that we use online and in our workplaces have various kinds of um, operating systems and levels or layers of applications that are needed to perform the functions. Uh, data often stored in these large uh, data centers and data is structured in formalized ways for ease of retrieval and processing. Large operations of society, uh, critical infrastructure are managed by computers and uh, digital data. And thus we have here a kind of, of course, abstract, but fuller picture of the IT landscape uh, and the way information systems and people and policies and processes are connected in the world today. Organizations. Well, organizations are entities comprised of one or more people and one or more purposes. And when we're talking about information systems, they are within organizations. So this board here is the organization where we usually find people, processes, policies, the hardware and the software. Although, of course, they are connected to the outside world. They are connected to other organizations that have their own uh, policies, peoples, and processes, and so on. Organizations are of different types and structures. Uh, there are many ways to classify and think about organizations. Uh, I will discuss later on some specific aspects of this major differentiation of organizations is not for profit, for profit, and government. But there are various kinds of structures, internal structures, structures of decision making that 
uh, qualify different types of organizations. So committee forms of decision-making, ecological structures, matrix structures, and hierarchical structures. Often, if not always, um, but I think pretty much always, organizations, um, not-for-profit, for-profit and government are hierarchical, but they do have different levels of hierarchy. So some are more what they call tall, some are more flat in their decision-making. But usually there's always a kind of hierarchy that defines organizations uh, of today. Here, taking a step back again, bringing that image of the multidimensional spheres of work and life. So our organizations are within social context. They are within the ecological uh, infrastructure of our planet. And also they relate with families and communities and uh, our biology and our biological and social needs. The organization people. How important is the organization in which work? For this discussion, I brought up the, the classic book, The Organization Man by William White from 1956. So when you, you see, I'm not reusing the term of the organization man, but just the organization people, because of course, women are much more integrated into society now, into the professional society than it was in 1956. By that, I mean into professional um, uh, white collar work and blue collar work and so on. And the question is raised of what organization means for society of today. And this is a little bit of a complex book and perhaps a complex idea, but I find it interesting for us to think about what organization means for our professional and social lives. And essentially what he suggests is that there is a myth of individualism that remains official. It was back then, and I think it is to this day, but be, the behaviors of people actually suggest otherwise. That is, we're not individuals. We don't oper do not operate as individuals, but we operate as organization people. Uh, the social ethic, as he calls it, is a kind of organization ethic, and it is the driving force for behavior. So we, we belong to the organization and not really the society. Um, and he lays out also this notion of the bureaucratization of society. And I think developing on the, the notions that uh, Max Weber had uh, identified and explained regarding the bureaucracy and the aspect of bureaucracy, by which I mean, let me clarify, bureaucracy is not just the government, that's public and private. Bureaucracy are the formal rules for the administration of information and people in modern organizations. And I think a revealing quote here from the first chapter is the following. In practice, those who most eagerly subscribe to the social ethic, this new ethic of modern life, worry very little over the long range problems of society. It is not that they don't care, but rather that they tend to assume that the ends of organization and morality coincide. And on such matters as social welfare, they give their proxy to the organization. So that is, we tend to think that just by focusing on the organization, that itself will lead to an improvement on the social ethics and social morality. If you work for Facebook, the role of Facebook is to connect people. Therefore, by working on Facebook, you're already achieving this high, beautiful moral goal of connecting people and their lives. Uh, the same could be said for other kinds of organizations. So it's a, it's a kind of a nuanced view, but I think an interesting uh, view uh, for us to, to think about here. And also it relates to this notion of a society of large organizations, which is a, perhaps it was in the 1950s, and, but certainly is much more in the 2020s. And who explored this idea very well is Perot in an article in 1991, where he writes that large organizations have absorbed society and develops this idea of how large organizations uh, have subsumed society. So it's like society is a smaller entity within organizations. Informal groups and small autonomous organizations have been overtaken by large bureaucracies, once again, public or private. Previous eras have had large organizations, 
armies, civil service systems, etc. But now there are large bureaucracies running most of economic and social life. So the food shops you go to, the coffee shops, the markets, the film theaters, the art equipments, the businesses, and so on. And these include the large organizations themselves, but also their satellites and branches, right? So we do see small businesses, small shops here and there, um, but uh, they often depend on other larger entities to get their goods, to get their uh, part of their services. And we thus find ourselves in this society of large organizations. Taking a look into some of the relevant statistics here is um, we, it's, it's been a fact that 90% of workforce works for an existing company or establishment in the United States. So only 10% of the US workers are actually self-employed. Now, self-employed doesn't mean um, small business, uh, doesn't mean that um, 90% of workers working for an existing company doesn't mean that all the companies are large businesses, but they are largely large businesses or dependent on other large businesses. We have similar numbers in the UK, 14% of all workers are self-employed. So the large majority of people are not self-employed. They work for an existing organization. Uh, that's 85%. The largest employers in the United States are Walmart, Amazon, Allied Universal, FedEx, Home Depot, and Walmart alone employs 2.3 million. Now this is actually global. That's the statistics I was able to get. So these are the largest employees in the United States, but these are the global number of employees. Uh, as you're probably aware, we have in the uh, 20th century, in the 1900s, moved from a manufacturing and agricultural society to a service society. This is what this graph shows here. The growth in the service industries, the knowledge industries, information industries, um, and uh, different kinds of what they call also the tertiary sector, which includes both white collar, but also some of the more uh, precarious uh, service and communication uh, work of today. We thus have a kind of uh, contrast between industrial and software economics or digital economics. And I'm using these terms here kind of loosely. So just, just, for, um, just for introduction to some of these ideas, and an interesting way to see this is to see the, the ratio of the revenue per worker within these firms. So you think about the Ford Motor Company and the JP Morgan Chase, and you see the ratio of revenue per worker. A Ford Motor Company around 683,000, uh, JP Morgan Chase 460,000. And then you could think of Apple, it's 1,867,000 revenue of the company for. Uh, over divided by the amount of workers in the company. Uh, of course, not all digital firms have this kind of ratio, but it is a characteristic of this uh, new digital uh, economics. If we look at Alphabet, the parent company of Google, we see something similar uh, to Apple, 1.3 um, million of revenue uh, dollars per worker. So that's, you know, three, four times more than the other kind of banking and manufacturing sector. And you may think, oh, that's great. So they're just making more money. It's more efficient. Well, it is good for them, but thinking of society more broadly, this is problematic uh, because as we see, it's not everybody that works for, for Apple or Alphabet. And in society in the United States, actually this is happening around the world too, we see the income of people actually going down. I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but the real income that is adjusted for inflation for the majority of the population in the United States is going down, not up. It's not even staying steady. So here's a graph of the um, a different income uh, percentiles. So we have the fourth 20% 20, 20, uh, of the bottom of the population, 20%, uh, 20% here, and then 20% here. So this is 80% of the population, their incomes in real terms have been going down since about the 70s 
uh, to the present, while the income for the 20% of the population, whoever they are, uh, the 20% of those making the most money have been going up. So this helps us contextualize the kind of economics that we live in today and how our um, working organizations make sense. So what we really have are conflicting trends as people tell the importance and beauty of entrepreneurialism and point to the possibilities for decentralized work that do in fact exist, right? It's much easier nowadays for you to buy a camera, buy a camera, buy a computer and set up a, TV, a YouTube channel and actually become successful. It's really possible. Um, but work has become more precarious and organizations are larger than ever dominating what society themselves do. At the same time, we don't see income for the majority of people increasing in uh, real terms or just for inflation. Now, of course, uh, the conversation is more complex. Technologies are more available. Technologies themselves become cheaper. So it's cheaper now to buy a refrigerator than it was a simple one, at least um, some years ago. But we do have these conflicting trends happening here. And I think this uh, paints the context in which we work today. That's it for this one. I'll see you next time.